Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsman from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are talking today about the readings for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020, which is the memorial of St. Charles Luanga, great saint. Uh, but the readings that we're going to be talking about are those of the Wednesday of the ninth week of ordinary time in year two. Remember how the weekday Masses run on a year one, year two cycle, while our Sunday Masses operate on the years A, B, and C. So, uh, what's going on in ordinary time at this uh, point in the liturgical calendar is that we are getting a broad exposure to Scripture. Uh, the Gospel readings stay the same for years one and two. We read through, in the course of ordinary time, uh, the three synoptic Gospels, uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, in that order, not in canonical order. Interestingly, we start with the shortest Mark, and then we do Matthew, and then we conclude uh, with Luke. Those are the synoptic Gospels, so-called because uh, uh, synopsis means to see things together, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, take the same basic uh, chr chronological uh, perspective to our Lord's ministry. They tell the events of our Lord's ministry in such a way that they could uh, conceivably fit within a single year. Um, we know from the Gospel of John that our Lord's ministry was in fact longer, but that's kind of a narrative presentation that we get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, so in the ninth week, we are getting close to the end of our Lord's ministry according to Mark. We're not going to get into Mark's account of the Passion Week because we just did that uh, during uh, Lent. And uh, so we just read the, uh, the ministry portions of uh, Mark and Matthew and Luke uh, during ordinary time. And uh, in the first reading, we are going back and forth between reading the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament epistles. And right now we're taking a foray into the epistles and we're actually in 2 Timothy, uh, which is an important letter of uh, St. Paul. Uh, some believe that it is the last of St. Paul's letters chronologically, um, a, a uh, missile that he uh, dashed off to his uh, protege, Timothy, uh, shortly before his um, martyrdom. And uh, that adds some em extra emphasis to reading 2 Timothy because we see it as kind of Paul's last will and testament to uh, his uh, closest disciple, if you will. So let's begin looking at uh, 2 Timothy uh, 1 here. Our reading is 1 verses 1 through 3 and then 6 through 12. Uh, some beautiful uh, verses here, um, uh, many of which are well known and influential in theology for various reasons. Just a little bit from the beginning, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God for the promise of life in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Observe how Paul calls Timothy his child, which implies that Paul is his spiritual father. So we see um, this uh, paternal and filial relationship between Christians already in the apostolic age. That's a relationship that we could call one of spiritual direction or of discipleship. Uh, or in the Eastern tradition, they refer to spiritual fatherhood. So you might hear Eastern uh, Christians or Eastern Rite Christians speak of having a spiritual father, which is a... Um, an affectionate way of referring to a spiritual uh, director. Well, Paul was that discipler, that f a spiritual father figure uh, for Timothy. He goes on to remind Timothy, For this reason I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. You see Paul referring there to the ordination rite uh, by which he as an apostle conferred what we would now in hindsight, call holy orders. Um, the terms come later, but the reality is there from the beginning, right? This is the case with some of the other sacraments as well. Reality is always there, but terminology develops. But the imposition of hands, this is giving that authority from the apostle uh, to an apostolic successor. Um, Timothy is uh, what we would now recognize as a bishop. One who has the fullness of holy orders is a successor of the apostle. 
And uh, so Paul refers to that, and then he says, God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and self-control. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, that's a verse that my father had me memorize as a child. My father was a Protestant clergyman, and I was a, a fearful little boy, and uh, st- sometimes often still a fearful middle-aged man. And uh, so uh, to help counteract all my... Uh, Uh, fears and insecurities. My father um, encouraged me to memorize 2 Timothy 1.7, God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of power, of love, and of self-control. See, the Holy Spirit drives out fear. Very wonderful thing to remember as we're in the afterglow of Pentecost right now, pondering this mystery of our infilling by the Holy Spirit. One of the things that the Holy Spirit drives out when we're open to it is fear, okay? And it gives us courage the courage to face up to and to embrace suffering because Paul goes on to say, do not be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord, nor of me, a prisoner for his sake, but bear your share of hardship for the gospel. And this is a a lengthy reading, so I want to focus in on this exhortation not to be ashamed, which occurs twice in this first reading. First, uh, earlier here, St. Paul um, exhorts Timothy, don't be ashamed of your testimony, but bear your share of hardship. And then later, uh, St. Paul says, um, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher. On this account, I'm suffering these things, but I am not ashamed, St. Paul says. He's not ashamed of his role. He's encouraging Uh, St. Timothy not to be ashamed of his vocation, nor is Paul ashamed of Paul's vocation. He says, I am not ashamed, for I know him in whom I have believed, and I'm confident that he is able to guard that which he has entrusted me until that day. Um, That's a beautiful passage uh, that was set to music famously um, by, uh, by Charles Wesley in a a well-known uh, Protestant hymn. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him unto that day. And many evangelicals grow up singing that as I did, a beautiful setting of this passage from uh, Second Timothy. But Not being ashamed, why? Because we're confident that Jesus is going to vindicate us in on that day, the day of judgment, okay? That we will be vindicated, our justice will be shown before the world, and those who have persecuted and accused us will be put to shame, uh, but we will be embraced in the love of God the Father. Now, this um, is really something to consider. Uh, both these exhortations not to be ashamed as we ponder this first reading. Um, as we're moving forward into ordinary time, filled with, the, filled with the Holy Spirit, as we reflect on Pentecost, recall that immediately after being filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles themselves uh, were faced with severe persecution. So, you know, we, we had those readings earlier in the Easter season, but uh, after Acts 2 comes Acts 3 and 4 and 5, and those chapters are full of the apostles being uh, brought before the Sanhedrin for judgment, being beaten. Uh, Later on, um, the whole church is, uh, with the exception of the apostles, is driven out of Jerusalem. So now we are thrust out into uh, the real world as we come out of the Easter season, we're back to ordinary time, and we face this reality of persecution for the sake of our testimony to the gospel. We know that it's not popular being a Christian these days in American culture, that standing up for basic moral principles, the truth about marriage, the truth about uh, the life of the unborn, and many other uh, issues that we could mention uh, immediately ignite uh, a real pushback. Uh, But let's not be ashamed of speaking the truth, always speaking the truth in love, however. Um, Let's not be ashamed to be identified uh, with Jesus Christ. Let's not be ashamed to wear some, uh, you know, tasteful symbols of our faith, maybe that crucifix around the neck or something uh, that uh, that is a, a, 
tasteful sign to other persons that we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. Um, let's not be ashamed of making the sign of the cross in a restaurant uh, to pray before a meal. Uh, these other kinds of gestures that mark us as Christians. Uh, these are ways that we give testimony to our faith. Um, and let's bear with the insults, the snide remarks, the snarkiness of people on social media or in our workplace with a smile. Uh, let's return good for evil. Let's return love for uh, bitterness because we're not ashamed of what we've been called to and we know that we'll be vindicated by Jesus Christ on that day. Uh, let's move on to our gospel reading and during this ninth week of ordinary time we're nearing the end of our Lord's earthly ministry in Mark and we have a famous uh, series of stories of Jesus debating with various um, contrary groups uh, in Jerusalem as he, as it were, holds court. And I use that uh, advisedly. He holds court in the temple. That's, that's uh, appropriate because he's both king and God. And in ancient Israel, the palace and the temple were side by side on Mount Zion in the heart of Jerusalem. And now Jesus goes up. He's both the son of David in the mode of Solomon, that great son of David who was filled with divine wisdom, and he's also God incarnate. And so the temple is his proper palace as king and God. And just as we remember from the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings, how Solomon held court in Jerusalem and people came from all the nations and tested him with difficult questions, most notably the Queen of Sheba. And he answered all their questions and solved the dilemmas that were brought to him with divine wisdom. Remember the famous accounts of the two prostitutes that pose this uh, seemingly insoluble dilemma to try to figure out whose child of these two women the child really is. And Solomon devised a way to smoke out the true mother, um, showing his divine wisdom. Now our Lord Jesus uh, David's greater son is now sitting, as it were, enthroned in the temple and ask, answering all the hard questions that are brought to him. And so up to bat in today's reading are the Sadducees, okay? The Pharisees have had their turn uh, in a previous reading, and now the Sadducees come. And now the Sadducees were um, the chief priests and their retainers and their associates who were religious professionals, but who had fallen into what is to what what is kind of the um, the occupational hazard of religious uh, professionals, and that is to become jaded and cynical, and to begin to treat religion as a trade or a profession that you perform, and uh, lose your faith and your hope in what you're actually practicing and teaching. So the Sadducees uh, were involved in running the temple, um, but they were very short on faith, uh, and they didn't actually believe very much, didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in spirits. Um, they were, um, you know, uh, kind of, we would think of them as liberal or secularized uh, in nowadays, like, you know, secularized religious professionals is what they were like. And they, they've thought, you know, a life to come in the afterlife. This is a bunch of hooey, pie in the sky when you die kind of stuff. Oh, heavens, who could believe that? And furthermore, uh, according to the Sadducees, the idea of a resurrection and a life to come produced insoluble dilemmas that just couldn't happen and therefore it can't be true. One of the insoluble dilemmas that the Sadducees thought a life to come would pose was what about marriage and what about people who have married to more than one person in this life and then you got to sort that all out when everybody's resurrected so obviously there can't be a resurrection so they come to jesus and said they say a teacher moses said if someone's brother dies leaving a wife but no child his brother must marry the wife and raise up descendants this is what we call levirate marriage um, using uh, the Latin term levir, which means a brother-in-law or brother-in-law marriage. It was practiced not only in Israel, but in other cultures as well. 
So the Sadducees go on, well, we had seven brothers, first married a woman and he died and there was no heir. And so the second brother married her and he died, no heir and so on all the way down. All seven brothers married her and, and then they all, then the woman herself died. And okay, so now teacher in the resurrection, how is that going to be sorted out? <laughs> Like, what you going to do with that, rabbi from Nazareth? Okay. So they they stifle their snarky giggles uh, while they uh, wait for this uh, teacher to answer them, thinking that they have him trapped uh, like a bunch of reporters pressing a politician. And Jesus says to them, Are you not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? I love that line. That's the line we're really going to focus on today. Are you not misled? Because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Those are two, not knowing those two things uh, are, is one of the, are two of the major causes of us falling into heresy or damaging our faith. Because we don't know the scriptures, we don't know the Bible from beginning to end. Or maybe we do know it, but we don't know the power of God. We don't really trust in God's power. We don't believe in God's power. And so the scriptures is just head knowledge to us, just theoretical. And we don't actually uh, live our lives based on it. So what is uh, Jesus going to say? When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. Notice it doesn't say they are angels in heaven. That's a popular misconception. We don't become angels when we die, but we're like angels in as much as we're not married. Now, there's other ways that we're not like the angels, even in the resurrection. But anyway, as for the dead being raised, Jesus says, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. Oh my goodness. This is a brilliant exegesis of the Old Testament from uh, Jesus of Nazareth. You see, the Sadducees only accepted as inspired and canonical the books of Moses. And because the books of Moses do not explicitly testify to the resurrection, the Sadducees did not believe in it. So the challenge of the Sadducees was produce a text from the books of Moses that can demonstrate the resurrection of the dead. And this is somebody, something that had never, no, one, no theologian, no Bible scholar in Jewish history had been able to do. Okay, it was kind of like uh, Fermat's theorem, for those of you who know a little bit of math. You know, this is theorem that's out there and nobody had been able to prove it. Uh, and then somebody comes along and does it uh, and wows everyone else. So uh, Jesus now has this, this exegetical challenge proved to the Sadducees based on the, on the books of Moses alone, the resurrection from the dead. And what does Jesus do? He focuses in on Exodus 3 and the tense of the expression, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, in the Hebrew, it's just, it, it is a present tense expression. There's no copulative, no form of the verb to be. And the natural way to translate that is as a present. There was a way in Hebrew to say, I was the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, which is what God would have had to have said if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were really dead. But they're not really dead. So God doesn't introduce himself to Moses as, I was the God of these dead guys, but I am the God of these implied living guys. And the Septuagint, the Greek translation, rightly translated the Hebrew using the present tense ego amy, I am, not I was, okay? So Jesus focuses in on that small detail, the tense of the expression in Hebrew and Greek, and from that bases his uh, proof to the Sadducees that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not die with their physical death, but they continued to live. And by implication, one day God would give them their bodies back as well. So you are, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay. You are greatly misled. And so that, that ties back to our first reading again, you know, when, when, um, 
uh, St. Paul says to Timothy, don't be ashamed because uh, we are going to be vindicated on that day, he uh, refers at the end of our first reading. And that, that day, that expression is talking about the, the day of the resurrection, the day of the general judgment, when we're going to see Christ and all things are going to be put to right. And uh, that is our hope as Christians, um, that uh, our physical death uh, is not uh, the end of the story. Uh, and that hope in the resurrection for the dead, from the dead gives us the courage to face up to um, subtle as well as even violent persecution in this life. Remember, it's the feast day of St. Charles Lawanga, who was violently put to death. And um, we may not experience that in our lifetime, or maybe we will. Who knows how things are going to go in our culture. Uh, but whatever form of persecution we face, we face it with courage, we face it with joy, because we know that uh, he in whom we have believed is able to keep that which we have entrusted, which is the hope for our future and our hope for eternal communion with God until that day when he delivers it visibly, that day of judgment and resurrection. Let that be our joy this day on this uh, Wednesday of the ninth week of Ordinary Time, the Feast of Charles Lawanga.